Thanks, Dr. Ratner and Marks. It's, uh, it's a very much a pleasure to be here. I think our time is... It's a big okay. time. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So I have no disclosures. I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to discuss several cases that I think illustrate the uh, importance of recognizing uh, uh, a foreshortened esophagus and, and uh, therapy for it. First case, uh, initial evaluation prior to initial operation was uh, a very, very severe reflux, had Barrett's esophagus, underwent uh, a halo ablation, then went Nith underwent Nissen uh, multiple years ago, a redo Nissen the following year, both done at the same academic center, outside center. And we see a uh, patient still with uh, recurrent reflux symptoms, has a two compartment stomach. You can see the uh, slipped wrap, the wrap is clearly placed around the gastric cardia. You can see the uh, long segment Barrett's esophagus, uh, and, and then you can see the shape of the that cardia is really tubularized. You can maybe understand why they may have wrapped the stomach even the second time. This is what it looks like. You can also see where the, the, the interface between Barrett's esophagus and these gastric folds are, and that's something very important to recognize that when you're revising someone who has uh, a slipped wrap, uh, two compartment stomach, and Barrett's to identify the GE junction, and here's on retroflex. So our current uh, assessment was uh, reasonable for Nissen fund application. And so, so in, at revisional operation, this is a third time operation. I'll help this along a little bit. We approach that in much the, the same way as all of our redos, taking the liver off uh, first, getting a Penrose around the hiatus, uh, and then getting in to do the hiatal dissection. Uh, this is uh, always very difficult at the, at the third time, but it's something that uh, you have to be very, very careful. I like to use scissors rather than uh, the, the ultrasonic shears for this. This is going to the base of the left cruise, and we try to uh, expose the base of the left cruise uh, and take the uh, prior fund application off the, off the left uh, curl pillar. And then we start at the base of the curl closure uh, and then we can always uh, try to find a plane uh, in, into the posterior mediastinum, and then we're going to just do a very uh, careful dissection of the posterior mediastinum. I'll move this along a little more. And so here we've uh, entered the posterior mediastinum. We're dissecting the adhesions off the base of the left curl pillar. And then so you can see the, both uh, the hiatus kind of taking shape, and we've taken most of these adhesions uh, down. Okay, so now we're into the mediastinum, and we'll do our, a complete mediastinal dissection. And really, in these cases, the short esophagus, we really wanted to dissect uh, all the way up to the, to the pulmonary hilum uh, in that plane between the the pericardium and esophagus up to where you can see the inferior pulmonary veins and then you get somewhat diminishing returns trying to go higher than that. But in this patient we're really concerned about the foreshortened esophagus so we want to really maximize our intra-abdominal esophageal length. Now you can see where the wrap is now. It's really quite scarred. You can see some ethabons that will kind of lead you to where the wrap is. I don't really like to attack it anteriorly in this multi-redo setting. I like to go down to the base uh, of the, the of the, uh, the patient's right aspect of the, of the fund application. You can, I can usually find a plane in there, you can kind of see, uh, and then that usually helps me get into that plane underneath the fundus. So you can see this plane kind of starting to develop, and then we'll take our fund application completely down, and then we'll do our esophageal length assessment. So here's taking the kiss of the fund application. I, some people staple this. I like to use scissors and just kind of, if I can find the, uh, the, where the sutures are, I know I'm in the right spot, and uh, just kind of very uh, gently tease this, uh, this uh, uh, apart, uh, and then uh, take the entire wrap down. You can see I'm coming up on an ethabond, so I know I'm in the right plane, right between the two kisses of the, of the fund application. Okay, so then we take the wrap down, we do intraoperative endoscopy, and that light was where the, where the GE junction actually was. So once we've taken the fundus down, we can see that uh, 
we have about a centimeter of true esophagus in the abdomen. We do that with intraoperative endoscopy. On the multi-redo setting, it's a little harder to actually identify uh, the, the GE junction externally, so we use endoscopy to help us. And we can see our, where our, uh, our prior uh, ethavons were, that's where our prior wrap was. And so where do you think the, the actual true GE junction was? Is it C, B, or A? Well, it turns out it was at A. You know, so it was a very foreshortened esophagus. So then we have to be able to deal with that at our revisional operation. But also note that the cardia is really a, tubule, uh, a tubularized structure. So a collis gastroplasty really doesn't help you that much in this setting. What's very important is that your fundoplication absolutely has to uh, involve the native GE junction. So you may have to include some of that tubularized cardia in your wrap, but you have to have the, the very uppermost or proximal suture has to include esophagus. So this is a uh, Nissen fundoplication redo around the 54 French bougie, making sure that uh, where we've endoscopically identified a true GE junction is included in the wrap. And with that, we can get uh, very good results, even with multi-revisional operation. So. So this is a, a, a barium swallow of this patient, and, and she has done uh, very well with that approach. So in summary of this uh, concept, the short esophagus with the tubularized cardia can be a common fund finding at fundoplication failure, particularly when the mechanism of failure is this two-compartment stomach where the surgeon has been misled and placed the wrap too low. So recognition of this finding can help the surgeon put the wrap in the right place on the first operation, which I think would be ideal. Now, of the two kinds of configurations of the foreshortened esophagus, I'm talking about the one on the right, which is some part of the, the cardia is in a tube shaped. I'm going to talk about this kind of configuration next, which would obviously require a collis gastroplasty to fix. So this patient has severe reflux, has about three and a half vertebral body heights between her G-junction and her diaphragm pinch, and a very large uh, inline uh, hiatal hernia. Her esophagus is not torturous. So this really would make you think that you would have to do a collis gastroplasty at operation. So I use the wedge fundectomy approach. I just use one stapler up, uh, one stapler down and one stapler up, not the starfish technique or some other things that people have described. So, and, and I also prepare these patients that they'll have to be on PPIs uh, afterwards because patients who have a collis gastroplasty are, are very likely to have positive pH uh, or positive acid exposure. And I say that uh, if, you have, if it takes you more than one fire up towards your GE junction, then you're relieving, a, a too, you have a too long a segment of tubularized cardia, and you'll probably wrap too low and cause a two compartment stomach. So we say don't try not to do that. So here's a case uh, that demonstrates that. I've already done the, uh, the, the, the mediastinal dissection in this lady, and again, I try to go all the way up to the to the, the pulmonary hilum uh, to maximize their intra-abdominal esophageal length. I think it's very important to completely take down the anterolateral hiatal sac. And so I take that with the, the ultrasonic shears. And once you get to the part where the sac is kind of triangular, I, I just take the superficial layer out towards the angle of hiss to, to, to very carefully take down those, uh, that fibrous tissue. So you can kind of see where the GE junction is. And then, then I remove the rest of the frontoesophageal fat pad. So in this way, one, you have to do this for a collis gastroplasty anyway to, to make sure you're not stapling through all this fat with your, uh, uh, with your uh, GI stapler. But uh, two, you really want to precisely identify the GE junction. I think this step is absolutely essential for doing that. So once you have this, uh, this uh, anterior sac and, fr and a front esophageal fat pad off, you have to truncate it. Don't follow it all the way back to, to take, remove the posterior vagus or anything like that. So then you can see that we have about a centimeter of... Uh, uh, intra-abdominal esophagus despite a very high um, mediastinal dissection. So I have the, uh, we pass a 5050 French bougie, and we'll do a, the, the wedge fundectomy type collis gastroplasty. So I use the right hand surgeon's port to uh, place a, a GIA 60. I always use a blue load for this. And you just try to, uh, try to uh, touch the end of your stapler in against that 50 bougie. And then fire, and you pick a point. Some people mark that. I don't tend to mark it, I just try to eyeball it. But you want to be about two to three centimeters down from your uh, GE junction. And then you'll take another firing up. Now, I don't like to close the cura before I do this because the open cura allows you some room to get your stapler in parallel to the esophagus. 
Uh, sometimes you, you recognize this after you've closed the cura, or, and you can still do it, but obviously you don't want to staple this, the, the, this cardia to the, cru the left cruz. So then what you have is basically a triangular shaped piece. It's about half the size of a, of a piece of ravioli. And so uh, that, if you've done it like that, then you've, I think, done it right. Now, I always take a, a figure of eight silk and, and just buttress uh, that junction of those two staple lines. Uh, and then so once you have that, and you see that, that there's that lateral staple line on the, on the gastric cardia, then I'm going to do my curl closure. And then I'll do a fundoplication based on the, uh, the wrap based on the patient's preoperative assessment of motility. I'll take that same 50 bougie, I've backed it up, and then I'll pass it again to do my fundoplication to avoid passing different kind of things. Um, so here's the fundoplication. And, and uh, so I'd like to see that the staple line is inferiorly on that uh, patient's right side of the wrap. So that really, that corner of the staple line defines where my inferior stitch will be on the fundoplication. So then I do shoe shine technique and then the, the fundoplication as, uh, as a standard technique. But again, that upper stitch of the fundoplication has to include the true esophagus. So you have to kind of mark that, mark it or mark it visually and know where it is so that your staple line is fully covered and you don't get dilation of that tubularized uh, cardia segment. So I'm going to go on to the, I have another short case that I think will be instructive. Okay. So, um, okay, so I have another case uh, that I think is uh, another illustrative of, of some uh, findings that may be important. So he's a very young man, uh, almost scleroderma esophagus, a long segment uh, esophageal ulceration, really quite severe reflux. So this is at operation. He had one of those very large hiatal hernia, but, uh, but a narrowed hiatus, so difficult, but still able to dissect his uh, esophagus all the way up to his pulmonary hilum. You can just see it's hard to get a good view of it. It was kind of a, a you know, it's difficult to do. It was very inflamed. So um, we were planning to do a collis gastroplasty because you can see he has about a centimeter of intradominal esophagus. So I leave the hiatus open to allow the bougie the easiest to passage down. Then when I have the, the anesthesiologist place the bougie, I always put the, the, the upper stomach on, on traction. So I, I'm gonna, let me stop this and reverse this for a second. So my anesthesiologist told me during this case, uh, the bougie doesn't quite feel right. And he told me that at 40 centimeters. So I said, well, we'll back it up, right? I mean, obviously back the bougie up and the, and the bougie kind of jumped back. And that is never, that is never ever good. So uh, then I did a, 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 diagno a diagnostic laryngoscopy and did an upper endoscopy and it had perforated the piriform sinus and then perforated back into the esophageal submucosa. So when I finally, it is bad. So then what do you do with that? I didn't want to place a bougie. This patient needed a collis, so I did upper endoscopy. And I think that this is a lesson if you're not prepared for some reason to do a collis but the patient needs it, then it's simply okay to close the cura and come back another day. Refer that patient out or to, to, to not just accept that wrapping the cardia is, is okay. So here's a, you know, about a centimeter of esophagus. There's a small segment of tubularized cardia, but this patient really needed a collis gastroplasty. So, and with that, I'll look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Ouch. Yeah.